Luke chapter number 15, and we're going to start reading in verse number 11. And the Bible says, And he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that follow to me. And he divided unto them his living. Not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have fain filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he had came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he rose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him, and had compassion, and ran, and fell on his neck, and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead, and is alive again, and he was lost, and is found, and they began to be merry. Our grace, Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for the reading of your word. Lord, we're thankful for what you can help us with, Lord, what you can teach us, Lord, and just how you can help lift us up, Lord, out of your word. Even passages of the scriptures that we've read uh, multiple and probably hundreds of times, Lord, I ask you just help me tonight. Lord, just give me the power from you, Lord, to convey to your people what you gave me here tonight, Lord, that it can be a help to each and every one of us, Lord, that all of us can walk out of here tonight closer to you than what we was when we came in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I alluded to that before I read the scripture, I got thinking about that, how so many times we look at something and say a very familiar portion of scripture. Now I know we could say what all should be familiar. Well, that's good. You want to tell me what Deuteronomy chapter 16 verse 30 says? That's not going to be something very familiar to a lot of us. Uh, That's just not going to be something we maybe have read a whole lot. But when we come, whether you might, maybe you sat down and you tried to read the Bible through in a year, or maybe you try to just have a daily reading or something, and you come across these portions of Scripture. Uh, maybe you're reading something else, and you come across these stories that you've read hundreds upon hundreds of times, probably. Things that you've heard preached out of hundreds, if not thousands of times, possibly. Why is it important to still start, stay, pay attention to those? Why is it important to still read through those and really focus on what they have? Can I say, first off, they can educate us. In 2 Timothy chapter number 3 and verse 16 of uh, portion of scripture we all know all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. But we'll take time, and, and maybe we've read that this portion of Scripture before. Maybe you've read it, like I said, a hundred times. But have you studied it? Maybe God lays it on your heart some other time to read it. Maybe you need to sit down and study certain portions of it. Lord, what are you trying to teach me? Do you know who it's written to? Who's he talking about when it gets to this? And go through and allow it to educate you and teach you some things that maybe you didn't realize before. When we spend time reading his word and we spend time reading even those familiar passages, it can envelop us. In Psalm chapter 119 and verse 11, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. It does us good if we continually put his word into us that we could uh, recite it. I remember our pastor talked about uh, here last Monday on visitation, talking about Brother Greg preaching that week before, that Sunday before. And he said Brother Jeffrey told him it was just like the old Brother Greg. Brother Bobby just got up there and recited scripture. If you've never heard Brother Greg Phillips preach, he'd get up and just recite scripture just like nothing. It was amazing some of the things that he had in his mind and could just easily recall, even what we might call obscure passage. It's not wasn't just everything that's familiar, but just verses that he had committed to memory and would read those things and we allow it to envelop us and just completely consume us and we can recall those things. When we're faced with troubled times, when you might get the call that something's happened to a family member or somebody's passed away or somebody's in the hospital, you can immediately draw that comfort from God's word when we allow it to envelop us. Not only can it educate us, not only can it envelop us, but it can enlighten us. In Joshua chapter 1 and verse number 8, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, and thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, that thou 
And for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Well, allow it to enlighten us. Allow it to show us some things. That's what this portion of Scripture here did for me about a month ago. I came across this, and I was reading it, and I found a couple things uh, that God pointed out to me, things that, that I've always, you, you read it and you notice it before, Brother Ray, but you don't really think about it necessarily. You don't really just automatically think about certain things that are said. And I'll get to those when we get to the end. Uh, but, you know, the first one you, that he really showed me is verse number 13. And it says, not many days. I, I just always read it and you think, that, you know, the, the father, brother Bob, gives him his, it gives him, divides to him his things and boom, he's gone. No, it says not many days. He stayed there for a few days. And then it talks about the famine. And I'll get to those things a little bit later. But what the, the thought God gave me out of all this and what I want to preach on, and I'll, I'll tie all this in together here at the end, is we better pay attention. We better pay attention. This is something that I had read through probably hundreds of times. I've preached out of here before. Preached at the jail out of this, verse, uh, this portion of Scripture before. But God still showed me something. Why? Because sometimes we need to pay attention. Can I say first thing we need to pay attention to is obviously we need to pay attention to the devil. In 1 Peter chapter number 5 and verse number 8, we know the, ver the scripture, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He is seeking everything he can do, Brother Clint, to devour you today. He is walking around looking at whom he can destroy. Why did he attack the younger son here? Because maybe the younger son wasn't paying attention. And he allowed the devil to get into his mind and think he was entitled to something. Think he was entitled to have something come his way. Think he was entitled to have it divided between Brother Tommy. And therefore ends up getting in trouble and we see him out where, where he ends up wasting everything and riots his living. Amen. But we better pay attention to the devil. Because he wants nothing more than to destroy us. You see a lot of this nonsense and things like that going on in the world. The devil wants nothing more than to get Christians to buy and go along with it. He wants nothing more than for Christians to say, well, a little bit of this will be okay. Or a little bit of that will be okay. Can I say that is what has gotten us to the point that we are at today. I can remember a lot of the things that we see on TV now 20 years ago. You'd be like, you know, just keep that in your bedroom. Don't push it down my throat. It'll all be okay. Well, now it's not only, it's not only just trying to push it down our throat. You can't watch anything on TV without certain things in there. You can't do any. You can't watch a commercial without seeing homosexuals or something on there. So you better be careful and be paying attention to the devil. He's going to put all those little things into your life and try to see how he can destroy you. We had a conversation that with my neighbor. Uh, I've actually had a couple of conversations with him now the past couple of weeks and just talking about some of the different presidential candidates. And I was like, well, you know, this guy sounds pretty good and this guy might sound pretty good, but I don't know everything they believe. Because we better watch and be careful because we put people in office at a local level and at a state level and then in a, at a high level that we don't, we, we tend to just want, well, he might believe in this, but you know, I, I'm all about this and therefore it's okay. No, it's not okay. If he goes against something with the Bible and you're like, well, Brother Josh, everybody's bad. I can find something bad with everybody. I don't, then maybe don't vote. You know, just leave it up to God and allow God to do what needs to be done. But we better be paying attention to the devil and the things that he's going to do. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Yeah. We know what he's going to do, yet sometimes we don't pay attention. And we end up way farther than what we ever intended to be because we hadn't been paying attention to the devil. Can I say secondly, and out of this passage of the scripture right here, secondly, we better be paying attention to how we're dividing. Look at verse number 12. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that follow to me. And he divided unto them his living. Now understand, he divided the father, divided everything he had, and gave that portion that the younger son thought he was entitled to, that he really wasn't, but he gives it to him. How are you dividing up your stuff? How are you dividing your time? Think about this. We, we always get down to tithes. We think about tithes and giving 10% back to God. Do we come anywhere close, Brother Phil, to giving God 10% of our time on a day? Does any of us give God 2.4 hours of our day? I'm not even telling you you got to sit down and study the Bible 2.4 hours. It might be 2.4 hours in prayer, whatever it may be. But how much of our time do we truly divide and give out to God? When we get down, we sit down and we plan our day and, and we might get on a Wednesday night and you go home and it's like tomorrow I'm going to do this and tomorrow I'm going to do that and we, we mark down everything that we're going to do, where do we take time for God at? Are we dividing our time and making sure we're including God in there? 
Do we make sure, and I'm not going to argue with you if you want to do it beginning of the day, end of the day, middle of the day, that's between you and God. But are we making sure that we're taking our time and dividing our time with God? What about our talents? How much talent do we have that we're giving to God? If God has blessed us with a talent, whatever it may be, playing an instrument, singing, teaching, uh, uh, just being somebody that can smile, meet people at the door, whatever it may be, because that's a talent. I, I, don't, I, I don't like people that much, Miss Marcy. Stand back here and shake your hand let you in. But any talent that God has given us, how much of that talent are we taking and dividing and giving unto him? You know, I think, and, and, and I, I know if you know that song that guy in, in Virginia or whatever wrote and talked about, evidently that fellow has turned down over $8 million, Brother Josh, because that's not what he's interested in. How many of us sitting in church, supposedly saved, supposedly all about the things of God, did somebody was to come and go for us $8 million for our talent, Brother Daniel would run out that door and say, hey, I'll take that money, $8 million, Brother Ray, I could retire on that, you know, in a heartbeat. How many of us would run out that door and take that talent and not use it for God instead of use it for the world? How are we dividing our talents? How are we, I've already mentioned it vaguely, I, I won't say it and make you mad, you know, I'm, that's, I'll leave that up to the pastor, but how, how are we dividing our ties? Are we giving God what's truly His? We better be careful and pay attention to how we're dividing up the things that we have. When you think of, and I talked about a little bit about this, that younger son at this point in time in the Bible here, he wasn't entitled to anything. He didn't deserve anything. How many things are undeserving that are in our life that get more of our time, more of our talent, or more of our ties or anything like that than God does? How many things do we have in our life that really have no place being there, all for us no benefit, all for God no benefit, yet we spend all kinds of time for it? With that. And look, don't misunderstand me. We all need time to do certain things and take time. To, I'm not saying that, but they shouldn't come before God. Amen. Nothing should take place before God. We need to be careful in how we're dividing. We need to be careful in the decisions that we make. Look in verse number 13. I alluded to this a little bit a minute ago. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. Matthew, 6, 3, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. How many decisions do we make that we truly seek God for? Like I said, this was one of the first things that I really kind of thought about and realized that most of the time, I, for me, I, I can't say you, but for me, you read verse number 12 and you see the Father gives him and then he just goes. Well, he didn't just go, Brother Ray. It says after not many days. I don't know how many days that was, but it, was, it says days. So it had to be at least more than one. That he sat around and thought about the decision he was about to make, Brother Tommy. He sat around and debated. I don't know if he sat around and debated, you know, should I really do this or not? Should I really stay? Should I go? What should I do? Maybe he sat and he planned out, hey, I've heard this town right down the street. I've heard I can go do this and this and this one. And then I go over to this town and I can do this. And then I go to this town and I can do this. But we better pay attention to the decisions that we're making on a daily basis. He sat there. We, he had time. He had days that he could have went back to the Father and said, you know what, this was wrong. I shouldn't have done this. And given it back and stayed and continued to work and been where God wanted him to be. How many decisions do we make out of haste because we think it, it feels like the right thing to do? Right. It feels like I should do this. This is going to get me more money or this is going to get me in a place that I, I like better. This is going to be whatever reason, worldly reason we may want to use and we allow that to affect our decision making. Amen. Instead of going to God and truly asking God, God, what do you want me to do with this? God, what, how does this decision I'm about to make glorify you? Now, I understand you don't have to go to God and ask him what to wear to work tomorrow. I'm not, but those major decisions in our life, we need to make sure we make. Look, I, I, I don't know if I've ever shared this here or not. I have no idea. I know I've shared it at jail before. So if those of you that have been here long enough, you know, uh, Brother Tom, this is probably even before you all came. Back in 2000, I just happen to think I pretty much remember the year. Back in 2007, I wanted a truck. This is before you all was even old enough to think this. I wanted a truck. And Miss Tina probably alluded to this unless she's forgotten. I hope maybe she's forgotten. I wanted that truck, Brother Ray. And if you remember, I had that nice, pretty red Tundra. And at the time, I was working, had a good job. We was making good enough money, Brother Tommy. And I'll never forget, when she, when, I, when she left the dealership that day, just do whatever you want to do. Well, Brother Josh, I'd been married for a while and knew better than to make that decision. But I still made that decision, Brother Moore. And I just went and bought me a truck. Got me a truck, drove it home, and she wasn't real happy about that, Brother Ray. You know, within two years, 
that I thought everything was going great, Brother Brian. We lost all of our over... We, I mean, I was working, I don't know how much. It seemed like every other Saturday and probably 10 hours overtime a week. So within two years, lost all that overtime, lost all that every other Saturday we was working at the time, and ended up getting rid of the truck and getting me a little Corolla. If you want to know where the little Corolla's at, I'm pretty sure Brother Thad still has that little Corolla that I had at the time because he's got all my old Corollas. I never sought God in that decision at all. It seemed like the right thing to do. I wanted a truck, Brother Brian. And it was a nice, pretty red Tundra. I wanted that truck. I could afford it at the time. Can I tell you, it can save us a lot of heartache at times if we would just seek God and ask God, God, is this the right thing to do? Right. It might seem something simple like buying a vehicle. It might seem something foolish to you. It might seem like something foolish buying a vehicle. But have you truly sought God and say, God, is this, is this what you want? Because you might buy that truck. That might be a brand new one. It might end up being a lemon. Because you just decided to go out on your own and think, well, I need it, and I want it, and I have the means to get it, and that's what I'm going to get. Well, maybe instead of a Chevrolet, God wants you to buy a Ford. Maybe you need to seek and ask him, God, maybe I should get this vehicle, whatever it may be. Right. We better be careful of the decisions that we're making. Because the decision that we make today, we have no idea how it might affect tomorrow. Right. We have no idea how the decision, we, we, in, in the moment, it seems like the right thing to do. Right. But how is it going to affect our tomorrow, or the day after that, that only the Lord knows the outcomes of those things. We better be careful and we better pay attention to, our, to the devil, to the dividing and to the decisions, but we also better pay attention to the direction. In verse number 13, we know at the end of it, it says, and he took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. Which direction are you headed? Where are you headed tonight? Where are you headed? Now, we, hopefully if you're here and you're saying, you say, I'm headed to heaven. That's great. That's wonderful. Where are you headed in life? Yes. Yeah, heaven bound with the hammer down, I heard Brother Phil say. Where are you headed in general? What direction are you headed? Are you headed closer to God, or are you headed farther away from God? What is in your life? Can you pinpoint something in your life that is either hindering you from getting closer, or those things in your life that are helping you to get closer to Him? See, we, we, a lot of times we just get, get up and, 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 you know, like I said, I preach this to myself a hundred times, so maybe this is just for me. We get up and we just go through the motions. We get up on Monday, we go to work, we come home, we go on visitation, we go home, go to bed. We get up Tuesday, we go to this, we get up Wednesday, we go to work, we come home, we go to church. And we just get in the motions, and we don't pay a bit of attention to where we're headed. And all of a sudden, this little thing comes in our way, and, and, and we, we step into a little bit of sin, and, and we don't even recognize it at first. You know, it's just, it's just a little bit, and, and, and before you know it, this just little bit has kept us from reading the Bible for maybe a day or two, Brother Moore. And then all of a sudden, that little thing turns into something a little bit bigger, and next week we get to Friday, and we're like, I've not opened my Bible since Wednesday, and I hadn't opened it Wednesday since Sunday. And all of a sudden, we we're headed in a direction that's leading us far away from God. Now, I don't remember the full quote. I've heard it before, and I tried to write part of it down. Sin will take you places you never intend to go and keep you longer than you never intended to stay. We better pay attention to the direction that we're headed. Because if we're not walking towards God, we're immediately then walking away from Him, and we have no idea what that next day holds. This, this young man that he, he talks about, and he journeyed into a far country. We better make sure we're staying close to home and not going out into that far country because that far country too many times has things that we don't even realize it has until we get there and then we realize uh oh now look where I'm at can I say this next we might we probably would get done before it got dark look in verse number 14 or yes verse number 14 and when he had spent all there arose a mighty famine in that land and he began to be in want you better pay attention to the drought that you're in there's many times, as I just alluded to, that we come and we just go through the motions. And we don't even think about the condition that we're in. We don't even notice the things around us that are going on until we're way farther than what we needed to be. Until we come to church and we walk out of here, Brother Bob, and we're thinking, what did it even preach on? Was I even there? Yeah. Like, I was in there physically setting. I don't even remember who sang. I don't remember what he preached on. Because we've just gotten so dry. And it just don't do anything for us anymore. We continue to come because we just say that's the right thing to do and I'm supposed to be in church and I can't just not go to church. That would be terrible. But we're just in that drought. We're just dry. We just don't realize where we're at. Think about that. I looked up some things and I was going to get to this a little bit later, but I'm going to get to it now. Do you realize famine has certain criteria that it has to meet to be considered a famine? 
One of the big things, because you can read and find a lot of things about being without food and a lot of different stuff you can find, but one of the big things that I found in trying to look it up and study a little bit that I realized was the fact that a famine has to have people dying from hunger, Brother Bob. So this, that means this man... It says that when he had spent all their time, there rose a mighty famine in that land. So it had, people had been starving for so long that they are now starting to die, and he wasn't even realizing it enough that he's staying right where he's at. He's not even realized how, many, how people are dying around him and what it's doing to him because he's still just so caught up in his sin. Good. See, when we get that drought, when we hit that dry spot in our life, if we don't pay attention, well, we can end up in a bad, bad place. Our pastor alluded to it on Sunday. I think he alluded to it on Sunday. He might have even been watching preaching last night. Now I don't remember. If everybody that used to be or has come here before was here on Sunday or even tonight, well, how many chairs would we have to put out? We'd have had that back. We'd have had those back doors swung open. That would have been full of chairs back there. We'd have had to build a new building 10 years ago. Where are they at? Sure, some have moved away, but a lot of them it just gets where they don't pay attention. They just get dry. And you know, the problem with getting dry is that it, it, it doesn't happen right away. And we'll get to that in a little bit, too. You know, those people that just come, and all of a sudden it's okay to miss a Wednesday night. Then it's okay to miss a Wednesday night and a Sunday night. Then it's okay to miss a Sunday, or it's okay to, to just do whatever. And before you know it, they're just completely out of church. They're completely gone. Or maybe they're even sitting here, and we used to, I used to do this, and I used to partake in this, and I used to, man, I used to be the first one there for prayer 30 minutes early, and I couldn't wait to pray and, and, and just be here and fellowship around God's people, and now you're the last one to walk in the door. At, you know, at tonight we started at 7, so 7.05, or whatever it may be. We just get dry over time. We don't pay attention to the drought. Be honest with yourself. I'm going to ask you a very serious question right here. We're not done. We're not close to done. We're close to done. Very serious question I want you to ask yourself tonight. Are you closer to God than you was a month ago? What about six months ago? What about last year? If you're truly honest with yourself right now, are you happy with where you are now than where you was a year ago with God? Or have you hit that drought? Have you hit that dry place? But hey, I'm continuing to go to church. I continue to do this and that. And, you know, I continue to maybe teach a little or preach or whatever it may be. And you just think you're okay. But when you get down to it and you're honest, well, you've just gotten dry. You're just not near the person that you was back then. We better pay attention when that drought comes. He didn't pay attention to the drought. He didn't pay attention to all the things that were going on around him to the point that has now reached a famine state. And that's where he finds himself hungry in. And when he finds himself hungry, that's when you better pay attention to who your dear friends are. Can I say one of the things I tell people at the jail all the time? I say you need to get in a good Bible-preaching, Bible-believing church. I say we hope it's ours. We, we obviously, we're, we're coming. We obviously, we hope that it is our church, Brother Peter. That's where we wanted to see you go. But the reason you need to get in that, yes, you need to be saved. Yes, you need to be attending church. Yes, you need to continue to grow in your Christian walk if, you're, if you are saved. But you need to get yourself around those people because I have come to realize a lot of those people that you deal with in jail, that's all they've known. The sin, the drugs, the whatever it is, that's all they've known. Grandma and grandpa did it. Mom and dad do it. Aunt and uncle do it. The kids do it. The husband does it. The wife does it. That's all they know. So going back into that, going, trying to go back home and going back into that, I can't tell you how hard it would be just to say, hey, I'm done and walk away from all that. That's all your friends do that. I, I can't tell you how hard that would be to walk away. I said, so you need to get in a good Bible preaching church that has those people that you can count on, that has those people that when you're faced with that, you can call, you can text them. And you know what? Maybe you go to McDonald's and have a burger. Maybe you go to, maybe just be able to call and text them up so that instead of going and getting high or going out and getting your quick fix or whatever it may be, you have that person you can talk to that can talk to you off that ledge, so to speak, that person you can talk to and get the help that you need not to end up back here in jail. So we don't have to see you three or four times or five or six times or whatever it may be. We better pay attention to who our dear friends are and who we're keeping close. In verses 15 and 16, it says, And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have fain filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. He's working for this fellow. He's went and joined himself to this citizen, and he's working for him, Brother Ray, and the fellow won't even feed him. 
Or do we pay attention to who we keep close? Do we pay attention to who our inner circle is, so to speak? Because too many times, I'm afraid, we get those people that are out in the world as who becomes part of our inner circle, and they don't have our best interest at heart. They don't always have our best interest. We go and we're looking for advice and, and you, this might be casual conversation at work or whatever it may be and you, you bring something up and you're like, you know, I'm really struggling with this. They're not going to give you good, sound spiritual advice, Brother Donald. They're going to tell you what the world thinks. They're going to tell you what they think, how they would handle it. Well, that's great. You're not going to church. You don't know what it is. We better pay attention to who our dear friends are. Why do we need to pay attention? This is, this is the... the, the crux of where all this came from this is the crux of what god showed me in this and reading this story of things that 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 i hadn't really thought about and i even asked miss tina uh you know and and she's smarter than i am brother ray so she's like well no you know he was gone for a while and and brother it, and you know he didn't leave right away and all those things so it was just me that's late to the party brother randy but as i alluded to in verse number 13 and not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey so he didn't leave right away after he got it. He sat there for a few days and waited and all this. And the fact in verse number 14, and when he had spent all there, arose a mighty famine in that land. So it takes a, a famine's not going to happen tomorrow. We're not going to wake up tomorrow and there'll be a famine all of a sudden in the land. Why do we need to pay attention? Because it don't happen overnight. Amen. You don't wake up tomorrow and end up dry. You don't wake up tomorrow and all of a sudden the devils just begin to attack. You don't wake up tomorrow and all of a sudden you're headed in the wrong direction. It's those things that happen over time. It doesn't happen just overnight that we end up in a bad place. We've made those steps. We've, we've made the decisions and headed that wrong direction over time that gets us where we are. We, we see this, and it, like I said, he was given all the stuff by the Father and then sat there for a few days and debated on what he was going to do. Sat there a few days and contemplated the decisions that he was about to make, the direction he was about to head. It didn't happen right away. See, there's a lot of things that, that we end up in that we could keep, or there's a lot of heartache we could possibly keep ourselves from if we would just wake up and realize and be honest with ourselves and where we're at. You know, I, I alluded to, I, 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 t I don't remember who I was talking to the other day, and I told this, and I told our pastor a couple weeks ago, I believe it was, not this past Sunday, but the Sunday before, if you use our church app and read any of the devotions, we've been doing those now for six years. It's a long time, Brother Brian. And when I remember one of the very first ones I did was something about hymns and something about that, and that old song where it says, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. How much peace do we forfeit because we don't pay attention to where we're going? How much peace do we often forfeit because we just go through the motions and we, we're not honest with ourselves in the direction that we're headed? We're not honest with ourselves and how we're truly seeking God in the decisions that we make. We're not honest with ourselves and how much how invested that we truly are, where we're dividing our time at, where we're dividing all of our stuff out at. We say, oh yeah, I read my Bible every day. That's great. Is that all you're doing is you're just sitting down and reading these? You know, you sit down and read this. Oh, I've read this before. I'm just going to go through these. You know what? I'll, I'll be extra today instead of just reading about him i'll even read where uh the older son is mad and comes to it and i'll read all 20 verses there at the end or whatever and look at me today look how good i did and we don't pay a bit of attention to it right. are we truly invested in the things of god are we truly paying attention to where we're at are we truly honest with ourselves or where we are he didn't end up in that pig pen overnight can I say he didn't, he didn't just decide to go overnight that we alluded to. And he stayed in that drought. He stayed in that drought so long, that even that dryness so long that it turned into a famine all the way to the point even then he still wouldn't get out. Yeah. That he went and he couldn't even get what was, you would think somebody that has, uh, that, that has hired him on and done all those things would at least feed him. We find ourselves a lot of times way far that I talked about sin, way far than we ever intended to go because we just don't pay attention. We just don't pay attention to what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Sure. We just go through the motions. And, and before you know it, we're way farther than we ever intended to go. We're way farther away from God than what we ever intended to be. Can I say I truly believe we, we could have revival if we would just wake up sometimes and pay attention to what's going on. 
we could wake up and pay attention and, and realize the things. Do you, I don't remember now when this was. You know that we, we know the Bible talks about uh, um, earthquakes and diverse places and all these different things. And I don't remember. It was I think it was not too long after the Maui fires. Within like one 24-hour period, I, I, there was like I don't remember how many like hundred earthquakes or something like that. And a lot of them in the United States, but we don't even hear about them. So we don't pay attention. If we truly paid attention to how soon it could be that God's coming back, we would come in here a whole lot different. We would come in to our, ch our church services each and every time that we have way different than what, than what we do if we were truly paying attention to what's going on. If we truly believed everything that was going on. How much do we truly pay attention to all these things? We don't pay attention and we, we get to where we're, we're worried about everything else instead of just depending upon Jesus. How much Jesus is truly in your life? I'm not asking you how much you love him. We'd, if I ask everybody in here, raise their hand. Hey, I love Jesus. I love Jesus. He's everything I got. I love him. I want to do everything for him. But do we? It's easy to roll off the tongue. I want to do everything I can for him. But do we? Are we truly paying attention to how we're living our life? Do we do everything we can for him? And you might not be. That's wonderful if you are. Are you truly giving everything you have? Are you truly paying attention and like, you know what, I, 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 could, I could not go and, and do this, or I could not do that. I could cut back that one $6 you know, pumpkin spice latte this week and give a little bit extra to God, it might be. I'm not going to have to drink that. I make fun of those, brother, because right? I don't like that kind of stuff. You know? It's easy to make fun of the stuff, talk about stuff you don't like. Are we truly, can we say, you know what, I can take up, instead of spending that extra, uh, you know, instead of spending that time this weekend watching college football, watching five or six hours of college football, I can spend a little bit extra time reading my Bible. I can come in a little bit more prepared, a little bit more uh, ready for church on Sunday to see God break out. You know what, we might not be having church on Sunday night. We might just show up and, and God just get here and just get so big, we might have church right up until time to break for Sunday night. You know, we got to stop at 6 o'clock and go home because we've been here all day and we're all hungry. Right. We ever thought about that? Are we going to come in on Sunday morning, just can't wait to get out of here, hey, we don't have church on Sunday night, so I've got all these plans already made out. As long as we're out by 1230, Brother Ray, I can still be where I need to be by 1, and I can still do this, and I can go do this, and I can go do that, and I have my whole Sunday night already planned out. Where's God planned in all that? Yeah. Hey, it won't hurt my feelings. You all know I joke about it. I just preach what God's given me. There's a good chance I'm going to be out by noon. It ain't going to hurt my feelings a bit. Y'all just be getting started. I'll just roll right from Crescent Springs Baptist Church right over here to Emmanuel Baptist Church and have church again. How many of us have come with that attitude? Bring it on. How much attention are we truly paying to how we're living our lives? This man took time after his father gave him what he had. He still sat there for not many days, which is at least more than one day because it says days, so at least a couple days thinking about what he was going to do. And yet he was completely oblivious to what was about to happen. Amen. How oblivious are we to what we're doing with our life? That's how we end up in this part where we don't even realize the kind of drought that we're in, the dryness that we're in, that he was so to the point that it was in a famine and he ends up in a pig pen asking for the husk, that the, you know, wanting to fill his belly with the husk that the pigs ate, that the swine ate. Are we paying attention? Are we paying attention today where we're at? Are we paying attention to the things we're doing? Are we paying attention that we can be honest with ourselves? And you know what? I'm not as close to God right now as I was Good. six months ago, a year ago. You know, I happened to hear that song again the other day. First time I'd heard the song in years, that whole Alan Jackson song, Where Were You When the World Stopped Turning? Are you as close to God now as you was back when those airplanes hit those towers in 2001 and everybody else rushed to church? Most of us here was probably in church. Like, hey, I was already in church. You know, I, I already knew where God was at. But boy, that gave us a renewed sense of, well, we need God on the scene. Are we still as close to him now as we was then? How much attention are we paying? It's important to pay attention to the scripture because God wants to show us new things. As I said, I've read that. It's hard, it's hard telling how many hundreds of times I've read that. Hard telling how many four, five, six times I've probably preached out of that. And yet God still showed me something new. Why? Because he's got something he wants to show us on a daily basis if we would just pay attention. Ask Miss uh, uh, Renee, Brother Clint, y'all come get a song of invitation. I invite you to the altar. Are you paying attention? Are you paying attention to where you're headed? Are you paying attention to where you're at right now in your walk with the Lord compared to a month ago or six months ago or a year ago?
Let's pray while they're picking out a song. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for uh, everything you bless us with, Lord. We're thankful for the message you've laid upon my heart. Lord, I'm thankful for what you showed me. Lord, I'm thankful for how you gave it to me, Lord. And I just hope that I did uh, just any kind of been able to give it to your people, Lord, the way you gave it to me. Lord, it'd be a help to them now tonight. Lord, I ask you just bless this invitation. Just deal with hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.